Hi everyone and welcome to the Liverpool Connection podcast. I am your host Dazza and um, I've been doing a new series lately called Football and Music 101 and um, it's bringing musicians on to uh, tell their story of uh, their musical influences uh, but also talk about football and um, you know it's usually Liverpool fans that I brought on but today uh, I brought an Arsenal fan on so please don't switch off, please don't switch off. I uh, um I guarantee it's going to be a really good pod. Um anyways, uh he's been in the game for 30 plus years and I can I still can't believe that, you know, that you've been in so so long. Um he started out um with the prodigy uh with Maxim, Keith and Liam. Um 1990 to 2000 if I'm if I'm correct. Um and then, you know, went on from there. But uh, I'm I'm so proud uh, to bring on Le- Leroy Thornhill uh, to the Liverpool Connection podcast to have a good chat about music, life, and um, Arsenal. <laughs> Welcome, mate. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me, Dad. <laughs> we, we've probably got what you know. This doesn't go out for a couple of weeks, so uh, you know pe- people are, will have a chance. Uh, you know when I start promoting it to kind of go, ooh, Arsenal. You know, but you know what? I I think it's always good to talk. You know uh, about football. Um, you know, not just about Liverpool, but you know we've had so many classic matches against you lot anyway. So we'll get into into that later, um, but I want to start with your musical influences. You know, grow, growing up, uh, you know, what was the the Leroy teenager listening to back back in the day? God, uh, all sorts really. Um, I've always been into music, but when I was ten, my older sisters were into punk, so I, I've always kind of. Pretty much, I know that it sounds a bit stupid, but pretty much from the age of 10, I've kind of been into like underground music as well as chart music, commercial music and stuff. But yeah, from 10, I was listening to The Crass and The Slits and Lou Reed and The Velvet Underground and Bowie, you know, um, and The Stones, all that sort of stuff. So I was, I was kind of into that. And then I suppose around, I must have been about 11, 12 when the electro kind of kicked in. So there was this electronic sound and it was about dancing again and break dancing and everything. So, yeah, just always been into that kind of underground thing. And I suppose it was a little period where I was was a little mod for a while. So I was in all the Northern Soul stuff and and things like that as well. Um, Yeah. Yeah, break dancing mods, whatever was going on on the street, I was trying to find it, you know. Yeah, it's kind of the same with me. I mean, my me, me sister used to, you know, she was bringing home the, the 45s as like Erasure, Depeche Mode, and all that. So, mm-hmm. and, and Yazoo. So, I started listening to that, and I was kind of the same. I, I started to getting into the mod stuff, you know, because um, my dad actually was more on the, the Black Sabbath, Deep Purple side. But then my mum was more on the Northern Soul, so I, I would do the mod thing. So one year, you know, I'd be just as a mod, and then the next year it'd be like, you know, a break dancer. So it, it went from year to year, you know, just... Yeah, the casuals. Yeah, you know, yeah. and then obviously, you know, with the, when the casuals came, I, you know, I, I've pretty much stayed, stayed the yeah. casual. But for, for, for you, when did uh, like electronic music start, you know, take, taking over? Um, man, again, I, I, like you were saying there, I think all of us were kind of getting prepped for it with the likes of Depeche Mode and Gary Newman, <laughs> Nick Kershaw, Yazoo, you know, Vince Clark, Erasure, all that sort of stuff. We were, you know, we were getting made familiar for the electronic drums and sounds and stuff you know and then i was in hip-hop as well so then the electro thing obviously was drum machines and and stuff like that so yeah it was just a natural progression to go into the rave thing because um i think the hip-hop i was into hip-hop and still that sort of rare groove funk thing um and then yeah then the rave thing come along the acid house when that first come out it was a bit like 
Mm, there's not much rhythm in it, is there? You know, <laughs> you know, what I mean? that just the acid stuff. And all my mates were kind of like started going raving and having a bit of fun and stuff. And I was I was an electrician at the time, and I was still working. I was working down in Bath, so I was like three hours away from all my mates, and they all started raving. And I'd come back every three weeks, and they'd be like, oh, you've come down there and do this and do that. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> not really getting it I'd go out but I, I I couldn't get the acid house thing it was just too uh, rhythmless for me mm-hmm. right, so I went out a couple of times with them and, uh, and then after that I went to a couple of, uh, when it was a bit more ravey once it had gone I suppose acid house was so underground it was so early in the sort of 88 time you know 87 88 it was like so new it didn't register in my brain yet but um yeah it didn't take long before i was i was in there <laughs> yeah i mean back then i mean i mean for me as well for acid house there was too many bleeps and blops like i, I couldn't you know i i definitely needed a rhythm and it, it was just so like way way out there for me you know obviously yeah. i called yeah. gerald doo ray oh, oh, yeah, yeah. that yeah. that hit me like a ton of bricks and then uh, kind of the same thing with me you know me mates would take me to these clubs and i'd just stand on the side just going what is all this about we were doing the same dance. <laughs> yeah, but the more more I went, and then you know, I I I did go to Hacienda, and that kind of changed the way I thought about things. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I think as well the the early acid stuff was, you know, it was just four four again drums as well, and the, the equipment was so sort of basic sounding, like if you know what I mean. It, that was one of the reasons that was it was special, but it also held back the rhythm side of it because it was just pure technology stuff you know there weren't even like someone sampling a, a groove that's been played on a guitar or you know so the whole human element kind of was non-existent in a lot of the pure acid stuff so yeah you, you're not always going to get rhythm naturally anyway you know mm-hmm. how, how did you um were you already mates with with Liam and and Maxim and Keith? No, no, no. Uh, the same thing. We we were um, we met through raving, really clubbing. You know, I, I uh, first met Keith. Well, I met, actually, I met Liam before I met him. But I never knew. We never knew each other. I was DJing at a party with a mate. Um, DJ Physics, a guy I used to go to school with me, and him started DJing at school, and he got some decks. And we were doing a house party and some guy came up to me. I was playing Dom, the other guy, is off somewhere. And some guy came up and says, all right, man, can I have a go on your decks? And I was like, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ask, ask mate if there is, sort of thing, you know. And I thought, I don't know who he is. And, I think, and it was late, turned out later, I found out it was Liam. So, like, Dom, me mate, we let him jump on the decks and stuff, and he was like really good scratching and all that, you know. We were, yeah, mate, it's all right, yeah, 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 let's leave him to it and have some beer. <laughs> so I met Liam first, and then Keith, I met Keith just down the bar in the nightclub we went to. Um, so yeah, we just sort of hit it off on the dance floor and went to partying out, heading out to London all the time and stuff like that, and then. We sort of hooked up with Liam again, and he he was dating a girl who lived in Keith's house. And um, after we formed the band, we met Maxim because we we knew we needed an MC, and a friend of ours knew him, so we actually met Maxim on the first gig. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, we meet you down there, and sort of we sent him music, obviously, but um, yeah, we never met him until before the first gig, so that was pretty bad. <laughs> Man, that's mental because that could have really gone like you know belly up. I'm I'm glad it didn't. Like it, it it's well, just like when when you see all four of you on you know on stage though, you, you can tell like you, there's brotherly love there. You know, it just it, it just is. Like when can you can you remember the the first the first time you were all up there? Oh man, yeah, yeah, 
but it's like yesterday, all of it's like yesterday, really. Um, it's, uh, yeah, because we had, must have had about 30 of our mates had all come up there. Um, it was a tiny little club called uh, The Four Aces, and then the party was called Labyrinth. And, uh, yeah, we must have had at least 30 of our mates come up there. So we had a good little support, but the club was ran down. And um, tiny, tiny little stage. So like <clears throat> that was where we decided, right, man, we can't all go out because we had no, we'd never rehearsed, we had no idea what we were gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Keith were just gonna go and rock and Sharky. And the girl Sharky was with us. And uh it was just like, man, the stage is too small. So it's like, all right, Maxim, you're gonna have to stay over that side <laughs> and then we'll go on in pairs on and off sort of thing because you couldn't all fit out there so that's how we sort of really started with the on and off thing as well um and it was so hot as well so you couldn't stay out there for the whole time um but yeah i remember that a lot yesterday and we literally finished in about 20 minutes after the promoter walked into the changing room and uh he's just like yeah man i want you back in two weeks that was awesome you know <clears throat> and that that was it that was it we were rusky <laughs> It's funny. I remember the, I remember the earlier gigs. You know, most of them, and I said most of them, a lot of them, just like that. But it was the last year that I was in the band. <laughs> them gigs, I, they're the ones I can't remember. You know, mm -hmm. because wow, well, that just we were just everywhere, everywhere. You know, you know, we'd fly to like I don't know, we'd be doing like the Lollapalooza tour in America. It'd be something like. Let's say nine shows in fifteen days or something. So you do three shows, have a day off, three shows, three days off in the middle of it, back onto it, and it'd be like, oh, you've got three days off. So what we can make a really good idea. What we've done is we've uh, booked you a gig in Japan. So on your first day off, you fly to Japan. Second day, you play the gig. Third day, you come back. You know. And like you fly in Japan and there'd be a typhoon and you wouldn't do nothing. So you just come go to Japan for nothing, come back and carry on with the tour and then it'd be like go to Korea. Oh yeah, I'm vaguely remember that. And it's like, yeah, it got cancelled. There's a hurricane again. Oh, was it? <laughs> you know, it's just like, man, we were just yeah, it was like a pinball machine, the last the last last bit of it for me. That's one of the reasons I had to get out of it, really. <laughs> but whose whose idea was it to wear like the the clown costumes? <laughs> well, they weren't. They were. That was that was like, um, yeah. Keith, Keith, literally, as we're sitting there, look. And, uh, as you said that, look. As we're sitting there. Ah, <laughs> uh, focus, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Flinty. And Sharky, <laughs> as you said, it was sitting on my desk. But yeah, no, Keith was Keith. That was Keith. He was like, "Yeah, man, I'm gonna get some outfits made because we didn't want to. Didn't want to just look like we jumped out of the crowd straight away because mm -hmm. everyone would have just sort of jumped up there. We needed it to look like it was, you know, a performance or something else. So I remember they. Uh, keeps like yeah i'm gonna get some outfits made and yeah shark's gonna go for it and da 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 um uh, i'm not sure if liam had one for the first gig or not i'm not sure but i was like no man we can look like the fucking stylistics if we all like have <laughs> outfits <laughs> and then after the first gig i was like man i need to get an outfit <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah we a friend of ours is us jay we're still in contact with she um she used to make them for us. So I mean, yeah, the earlier day stuff they were more like ravey things to stand out. Um, but even to this day, I know you know Maxim's still getting his stuff made for costumes and shoe custom shoes and all that sort of stuff. But you, know, you got to remember, for me, it's just a complete nightmare because I'm six six, so I can't just go and buy stuff. You know what I mean? I'm the t-shirt master. <laughs> <laughs> everything else just don't fit me you know mm -hmm. yeah it, it must it must be crazy like you know being that tall as well like on those small stages oh 
and that's, that was like space. It was, it was, it's just the flying. It does me nothing. It still does to this day. You know, everything is just like, and the seats are probably smaller now, the leg room, than it was then. You know, honestly, I can get the pop, the the heel of my hand on the on the back on my the front of my seat, and my fingers touch the back of the seat. Confronted, you know, if I'm in economy and stuff, it's just like, like yeah, I have to pay extra to be comfortable. The price of being tall. Yeah, don't we all? Um, I, I mean, for for those ten years, I mean, Prodigy came out with probably three of the most incredible albums, like that I've heard. You know, Experience, obviously. You know, had had Charlie in it, which was. Yeah. You know, it, it was ch- charted really well, you know, for you and uh, kind of put put you, I would say, put you on the map. But obviously you were still doing all these underground parties But you know, the second album is where I think it just exploded. I mean, did any of you expect like to to be, you know, pushed in the limelight like that? Because. You know the no. rape, the rape scene back then. You know it's all ha- hardcore, happy hardcore, or your 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 jungle breaks. You know, and the, there wasn't really like superstar groups. You know, I mean, you had Underworld, but an orbital, but they weren't what what use lot were. You know, which was like in your face. So how how did you take that? I mean, you know, experience comes out like I mean it. it Never came off my decks for a long, long time until the second album, and then the second yeah, album just. I I think it was though, by the because I think uh, Jewelry came out in '95, if I remember rightly, and then '94 we we had added enough for the rape scene anyway. You know, it was it got it all got segregated and stuff, and it wasn't what it was. Um, but you know we. In terms of like Charlie, for example, we sold twenty five thousand copies when that was at number went to number three. Um, Brian Adams was number one. He'd been there fifteen weeks with Robin Hood or whatever, and he was selling one hundred and fifty thousand a week. <clears throat> you know, so on Friday night we paid to ten thousand, and on on Saturday we played to ten thousand. And then I do that for a month. It's not hard to sell twenty five thousand records. You know. Especially when everyone used to buy CDs and stuff then, you know, it weren't, and you always were, heard that track at every party, you heard it around your mate's house afterwards, you know, so it wasn't, it weren't big numbers or nothing to sell that amount of, to get to number three. But at the end of the day, Liam's a genius musically, you know, and as a, as a show, it was like a bit of theatre that everyone felt they, could relate to it because you had to even as a dj as anything if you're a performer you have to been in the other side on the dance floor to appreciate it i think you know as a dj you can't become a dj unless you've been on the dance floor Mm -hmm. you know in a club and you know what, what the highs and lows of the audience and the feelings and the emotions you know because that's what you've got to deliver when you're up on the other side of it so you know to this day i when I heard that music, I was the same as you hearing it. When I was, get out, man, what's this? Do you know what I mean? And play that bit longer, play it longer, play it longer. I could need to smash something up, you know? It was like, it's rock and roll. It's, it's rock and roll, and it, Liam, and it always had been. Dynamically, um, it, it was just rock and roll. We didn't, we moved out of the dance scene after the Experience album. Um because, like for us, if you think of England, techno, you heard a bit of techno within the night. And then by 93, 94, techno is in one room, drum and bass or jungle, whatever you want to call it, in another one. House and garage, you had to go to Vauxhall, London, and get your leather trousers on and your blouse and stuff. You know, and it all split up. And by, by then, we'd already sort of been started touring around the world you know so we'd go to europe and it's like man everything's techno mm-hmm. everything's techno so like we'd get inspired to put a tune with a bit of techno vibe in there so that we you know no good start the dance 
for example, was so much more European sounding than it was English sounding because it had a 4-4 drum and we didn't really do much 4-4 music, you know. And Liam would put breaks and rhythms on top of it all. But, yeah, if you look at really the second album, you, you've got... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, what's the other one? Uh, da, 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 da. Hyper, you've got hyperspeed, um, full throttle. You know, there's there's a lot more of a. It weren't a really a rave sound. It was more of a European, around the rest of the world sound because America didn't have a clue what what uh, rave music was. You know, the only the only thing that they could relate to because you had plus eight with um, John Aquaviva and Richie Horton and Moby. We toured with them in 92 or 91, 92. <clears throat> you know, so we were going around to these college places and no idea at all what the rave scene was or anything. You know, so you had to kind of have a bit of a variation of music that was going to work everywhere, you know. So we were inspired by all sorts of, of things come 94 and 95 and playing festivals and, you know, you you could play anything in a rave. Everyone's off their nut. You know, you, you could drop. I, I remember um, literally Aphex Twin dropping a needle on a bit of sandpaper. Yeah. When it was DJing, you know. But <clears throat> not that <clears throat> that's, you know, you know <laughs> that's too great. But yeah, so it was, um, you know, Liam's unique. And even to this day, I, if you look at his production stuff, if I say to you, pick five prodigy songs and tell them, hum me the bass line, <clears throat> you won't be able to do it. Because he didn't, there wasn't his concern, sub-bass. You can't get energy with sub-bass. Yeah, you can get pressure, you can get an air pressure, move the air, but you can't get someone to bite their teeth together. You know, you bring your eyebrows down, yeah, but you can't, you need the, that mid-range bass. And with Liam, everything was about the kick drum. You know, if you, like, like I said, after we speak, when you go away, you go and listen, try and listen to Liam's bass lines. You won't find them. Out of space, you won't find it. <clears throat> he just has a presence. The warmth is always there, but it's like that bass drum, 80 hertz in your chest every time. So you get the aggression, you know. Um, it's like electro music. You can't get hard, you can't make electro music hard, you know, because of the 808 drum and... This is another reason that kind of <laughs> killed the breakbeat thing recently, to be honest, over the last five years, six years, when 808 drum come out, and it's like, mate, yeah, it's loud, and it sort of shakes your ass and stuff, but it can't, don't sound hard, you know? And it's uh, it's just a frequency thing. But we never, he was always moved away from that. We were into dynamics, like when that comes back, it comes back and it sounds twice as hard as it was or twice as fast as it was, you know. So, yeah, we kind of moved away from the racing quite quickly, really. Yeah, it's like what once, you know, you, on on record listening, you know, you can get the vibe, but I think going to actually see you play is something completely different. I mean, I've seen you like loads and loads of times that uh, I actually keep coming back to the same video on YouTube, which is the Phoenix festival one. Mm -hmm. It just grabs you by the balls. Like yeah. it's, it's like all four of you are just on it, you know, like, and the crowd, like, I, I think that's what differs. I think sometimes from like the U S and UK crowd with, with the UK crowd, you get the pogo in. You know, everybody just jumping up and down while, you know, and, and there was no no mobile phones back. Well, I mean, people had mobile phones, but not like, you know, they do now where they just spend 30, 40 quid and just stand there with the mobile phone and watch. Why don't they just stay home, watch somebody else videotape it on YouTube? But yeah, I mean, the, the Phoenix one just like grabs me when I, whenever I'm like, you know, feeling kind of a bit blur, I'll put it on and it'll just change my entire mood for the day. Just because it's, uh, that's rock and roll to me. It's rock and roll. It's punk. It's just uh -huh. in your face. And, and 
I think I, I'd never heard, you know, like I said, other bands like that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm into my breaks as well, but the, you don't really see a lot of breakbeat live acts. You just don't, you know, it's more uh, te- techno based. Again, it was, you know, you can remember with the timing, you know, the timing was another thing because, you know, at the time you had Enjoy, me and Keith used to follow Enjoy around before we were in the band. You know, the band Enjoy, it was just like, man, they just rock. You know, we used to follow them around. And then uh, Shades of Rhythm were another band, you know, I used to absolutely love. Um, you know, Enjoy used to come on tour of us. Uh, uh, our manager was brother of one of the guys from Enjoy. Um, you know, I used to hang out with Shades a lot and stuff like that. And, you know, they, were, they would smash it in the in the dance scene and everything, um, Shades were slightly more likely to cross over because the music was a bit more commercially sounding, pianos and vocals and that. But, man, you know, it's really hard to to, to, to sort of say, man, there should have been a few more of us, you know, really. Mm-hmm. Even to this day, you've got Stanton Warriors, Plump DJs and stuff, um, who... None of them have ever quite crossed over the same, you know. You've got Norman Cook, you've got sort of like Baseman Jacks, where they just kind of have one track, really. Mm-hmm. Where's your head at, you know? But really, yeah, Underworld, yeah, Techno, that relate across the world. Um, same with all, but all again, you know. Um, and they, they, they're wicked as well, because it's, it's hard music. But... Yeah, you do kind of feel like there should have been a couple more of us. Liam's, absolutely, like I say, Liam's a genius. So I'm not saying, I, don't, I can't compare anyone to him because that was a question when people used to say, oh, what would you call your music? And if this is me answering, it's like, well, it's Prodigy. You tell me something else that sounds like it consistently and that's what we are. And they can't, you know, you know oh, well, that track sounded like you. Yeah, sounded like us. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's... Uh, it was just so unique. It was so unique. And the show and Keith, you know, the well, all of us, all of us, what the, the part of the jigsaw that we put to it all, you know, we all knew the aggression. We all knew how to bring out the best in each other. Um, yeah, it was like a little gang thing, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like and you're young and you just roll with it. Um, all that mattered was getting up there and rocking it, you know, and letting people forget about the shit that's going on in their life for an hour, hour and a half, you know. Mm-hmm. I think the closest in the beginning to me was Dust Brothers, Chemical Brothers, you know, before they became the Chemical Brothers. Song to the Siren to me, like, I was like, what? What is this? And I want more of it, you know. And they did, like, the Depth Charge remix. Um, uh-huh. That that was kind of, you know, the closest kind of thing. But, like, like you said, you know, Nobody touched the prodigy. So for me, like, you know, you did 10 years. Was it really hard to just go, you know, walk away from it? No, because it, it didn't need me anymore. You know, one, like I said, the last the last bit of it, well, I can't say. You know, we were, we were in control the whole way along. We we weren't like a manufactured band. We, every decision was was down to us. Yeah, of course you had people trying to sell us stuff. You know, yeah, you should do that. It'd be brilliant, you know. That was the problem after Fat of the Land, you know. It got to the point where it'd be like, <clears throat> all right, you've got a gig in Spain Friday, da, da, da. then you've got Germany Sunday, Saturday. Oh, and the gig's just coming from France. Really good money on the Sunday. It'd be really good. It's, you know, all right, and... Like that. And then you get to, you know, and then you just leave it in someone's hands and you get to the airport <laughs> on Germany on the Saturday, <laughs> on the Saturday. And then, oh, well, yeah, we've got to fly back to Stansted. There's no direct flights to France. So we've got to fly back to Stansted. Then we've had to hire two planes, one for the crew, one for and then one for you guys. It's like, what? So we're not going to make any money? Oh, well, nah, not really. Okay. So that amazing gig that you've sort of chucked in there that you're all getting your commission from, <laughs> you know, it's no longer a great gig. It's just a fucking effort that we've got to make, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it got like that. It, it wasn't, 
it wasn't too bad, but it was just like, you know, like I said, we still said yes to everything and, and, and kind of agreed to it, but it was, it was little things like that. It was just like, mate, you know, enough's enough. You, you know, you can't just keep on putting this out there on the road over and over again. And I'd stretch my ligaments when we were on tour in America. And you know, I remember <clears throat> that was in sort of 99 or something. I just remember sitting down with Liam saying, man, I don't know. You know, I can't have really enough of this now. It's uh, just want a bit of sanity, a bit of a normal life. Because um, again, I uh, and after once Keith done fire start and they and breathe and everything, it was just kind of like, man, it's just evolved again. You know, having been there from day one, from when Sharky was like, you know, guys, I'd rather be partying than taking this all serious. You know, so <clears throat> good luck to you. It was the same sort of vibe. It was like, look, man, you know, I, I can't be doing out of space and start the dance and that 20 years later or 10 years later, you know, and it, I feel like the spare part now. It's like I'm the only link to the past. Mm-hmm. So I'm stuck with the old stuff and the whole thing's developing into a whole new thing. You know, you've got Keith on vocals, mate. Every track you're trying to write with the vocal lines and, you know, so it's kind of like you don't need me anymore. You don't need a dancer. <laughs> you know, it's become a, a vocal thing. It's become involved into something else. You know, so it was like, uh, yeah. As soon as we stopped touring in '99, it was like, man, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to get back to it again. I think now we all sat down. It's like I think now's the time for me to to move on. Really, before we try and get back on stage or try and write anything. Don't have to think about anything about apart from what it's going to be, you know? So, uh, so yeah, well, it was just, it was a natural progression at the right time, you know? So what, what was your progression? Progression? Did you just, you know, want to take like a year off and then, you know, kind of sit down with yourself and, and say, you know, do I still want to do music? Do I want to do something different? Well, I'd started DJ. I was a DJ when I was at school, so <clears throat> I've always been into the music thing. And I used to DJ when we were on tour and around the world and stuff like that. You know, I'd, I'd still sort of slip in DJ gigs when I could. So I loved it. I, I knew I was always going to sort of try and uh, get involved in music. But yeah, I, I, I couldn't, man, I, I feel like literally, if you if someone said to me, you know, getting a hang of music it was probably only the last eight years or nine years I've really been happy with anything I've ever produced uh, anything before that was kind of <laughs> just lessons learning you know and I couldn't I can't write I couldn't write dance music I couldn't write dance music I didn't like uh no, I didn't like it I liked rock and roll and songs and lyrics I like things like that so I'd kind of done that indie flight crank <laughs> thing um, when I left writing songs and picking up a guitar and that I can't play and stuff like that, just being a bit punky. Um, so yeah, I, I can't, I kind of was into that, but again, it was like <clears throat> for me, days I couldn't play football, dude. And that was all I ever wanted to do, yeah. Uh, top goal scorer in all the leagues when I was under nine, tens, eleven, twelves, thirteens, all that stuff, you know what I mean? And like, um, yeah, when the band come along, that's like, oh, you can't play football in case, in case something happens to you, break your leg or something, you know. So, like, by, I suppose, by about 96, <laughs> you know, I kind of had enough of that. And I, we sponsored the local pub team. And uh, so I, I'd go in goal. And then I thought, well, there's less chance of getting hurt. But I'm, I'm like, well, I play anywhere, but I was a sort of striker, really. Uh, but I am a bit of a cat. It's just <laughs> so yeah, playing playing golf with a pub team, and then uh, then I started about ninety seven. It was like I got asked to start playing for the Arsenal ex professional celebrity team and soccer six and all that stuff. So I'd, I'd start doing that, you know. And literally the week after I left the band, I broke my leg playing for Arsenal. <laughs> so yeah, I'd always been in goal all the time, and then like. Yeah, man, I need to play again. So, uh, yeah, man, it's the best thing ever, you know. It's been amazing, amazing. But 
you know, even now when I sit here and I think of the weddings I miss and the funerals I miss and the, the things I missed with my family and stuff because, <clears throat> you know, you were on, on the road and that was it. You just committed to it. That was it. That was all that mattered, you know. But, but yeah, that uh, that thing just being, being normal, you know. I mean, it literally, I suppose three weeks ago, I played in a golf event for a, a charity thing for a friend who died quite a while ago but you know for about eight years every day every year oh man you can make the golf this year man i can't you know what I mean? so yeah it's, don't get me wrong it's the best 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 thing ever I've seen so many places done so many things but um yeah it was it was still a sacrifice as well you know for some normality and i miss normality i miss being at home i mean we would never go on tour for more than three weeks because we didn't want to get on each other's nerves. We didn't, we wanted home food. We wanted to go out to the pub and see your mates. Just wanted it to be normal, you know? So America, yeah, you come here and do a three, four month tour, all the stadiums. We're like, no, we'll come here for three weeks and then we'll go home for a month and you can fly us back again for three weeks. And then we go out and eat. But you won't make any money. We don't care. We don't go nowhere for more than three weeks. That's it. You know, we need normality. <laughs> So, um, That's a good way to look at it because, I mean, it, you know, these days, especially DJs are put on this pedestal, you know, and every every aspiring DJ kind of looks up to them and like, oh, my God, they get to these private jets and all this. But, you know, even like I'm not really into his music, but um, James Hype, you know, he does he does like a, a YouTube vlog and uh he was saying he's playing all, you know, he, he doesn't know where he's at. Like his, his road, road manager has got to, you know, pretty much say the name of the, the city or the country he's in. And he's like, you know, everybody thinks we make this crazy amount of money. And he's like, well, we have to p play for flights, hotels. You know, he has a, a sound guy. He has lighting mm -hmm. tech. You know, he's like, it's not this like glamorous life that these people think it is. We have thirteen people in our crew. You know, and they're all they're all want wages, and if you're doing twenty one gigs in twenty four days, you've got thirteen people to pay. You've got all their flights to get. You've got all their food to get. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. We didn't start off with thirteen people. <laughs> it kind of builds up as you go along, and that with the, with the the money as well, you know, but, but yeah, man, it ain't, it ain't, it's uh, proper hard work sometimes. I think we've done one year where we had, in three months, we stayed in 74 hotels and done the equivalent of flying the circumference of the world three times. You know, you don't know your ass from your elbow. You wake up and it's just like, where the hell am I on this tour bus? Well, the, you get on a tour bus in America, for example, Come after the gig, right? We've got a four hour drive, you know, and then you wake up on the, in a bed. Right, we're here, guys. We're at the hotel. Someone just give you a key as you get off in your bag and you stumble into this room. And then you wake up, oh, what the fuck am I? You know, like, don't know which room anyone else is in. Oh, man, just get stuff like, again, America from me. That's not my favorite place, but like, you know, we'd get stuff, man, you want to buy some crack? Outside the holiday in and that, you know, and then <laughs> you go into the where this is when we're starting out. We weren't staying in no big nice hotels or nothing, you know. If you like literally you go to a, like a hotel, shut the door in Fresno, and there's like seven locks on the back of the door. You know, and a sign, do not answer the door to anyone unless you're a hundred percent sure you know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, where can we get some food in San Fran and the hotel? Where can we get some food? Well, the hotel. If you go that way, um, one or two blocks, there's a pizza place. Don't go more than a black block that way. That's where all the crackheads and the drug addicts are and they rob, rob you. Yeah. Have you got room service? Yeah. <laughs> <You know. laughs> like guns going off and there's all us on the floor in the green room and everyone else is just standing there. So like fucking guns it's in New York. So, yeah, don't worry, it's a couple of blocks away. <laughs> you know I mean? That's a different life, isn't it? Like oh. uh, 
And it is weird. M- most outside of holiday inns, yeah, there is like crack crack dens and like you know, just it's it's seedy places in, in the town. But so obviously, you know, not doing the prodigy thing, and now you can co- you know concentrate on your DJing thing, you know, mm-hmm. because it's just you and you know you're, you're your own boss now, which which has got to be really good. You know, you pick the gigs. Uh, I I notice you know every season is festival season obviously in the summer with you know best of all and all all the the good stuff. What's uh what's one of your favourite festivals to play without you know and I, I know you, you probably love playing most festivals just because everyone's there to have a good time. But what what oh, one really stands out for you? I'm a happy to Glasto this year. Um but I think it's the ones where you can get to see see stuff, you know, you go and see the other bands that you like, and other DJ mates, because the whole thing is a family scene, really. Um you know, there's always someone I know at the festivals that uh you're going to get a buzz off. You always buzz more when you know someone, when they're playing, if it's a Foo Fighters, and, you know, Dave and all the, you know, when you know people, you know their character and you see them playing and <clears throat> it's always a buzz. Same with the DJing thing, you know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for me, what are you saying? <laughs> DJ, and anyone can DJ, I think, to an extent. I mean, yeah, of course there is technique involved, but, it ain't a big deal in my eyes, you know. When you when you're up there and you got to play your own music and perform, you're selling your soul. There ain't nowhere to hide, you know. <clears throat> you've got to have rights. You you you're gonna like. I'm gonna make you like me, you know. Yeah, when you DJ, you say, oh, I don't like that. I'll play Prodigy. Oh, you know that work. You know, it, it ain't no big deal really, and uh, I. I kind of, uh, I mean, I write a lot of my own music now, a lot, and um, I make a lot of bootlegs where I'll, I'll make tracks with Oasis, of uh, Foo Fighters, Chili Peppers, Yazoo, <coughs> Bjork, and I'll make these edits, the Beatles, so no, I won't give them to anyone, so I'm the only person in the world who's got them, so then when I play, I'm doing always doing something different that no one else does. Yeah, if you see, if you follow me around, you say, oh, God, he's played that Roxanne track nearly every time. You know what I mean? <clears throat> but if you, <laughs> but it's the same as seeing a band playing their own tracks. Do you understand what I mean? It's like that's one of the reasons that I, I can't say I stand out, but it's one of the reasons that I'm different is because I've got them tracks and other people haven't, you know? So that's the effort I, I like to make to... To be different, I, I like to play everything: drum and bass, old school, it's techno, uh, Lil Louis, French Kiss, all that sort of stuff. You know, to, I love educating people, but taking them up and down. You know, and I'm, like, again, I've never planned a set in my life. I wouldn't. I stand there ten minutes before shitting myself, thinking, oh, man, <laughs> "What's what's the first track I'm going to play? What should I start with?" You know, and I try and get them an hour before to check out what the other person plays and get a bit of an atmosphere and stuff like that. I can't just rock up. But, yeah, I, I love that. I, the audience picked the, picked the tracks for me, you know. It's like, well, yeah, they like it hard. I can keep going there. But, I, yeah, I can see they need to <laughs> I need to drop their energy a bit and educate them with something a bit different, you know, or I can see they're a bit more techno crowd. So <laughs> I'll stick with some tracks that have got a bit more chunky techie sounding rather than sort of like let's say raggery sounding so it's knowing the audience get some of these djs fucking idiots like, so how's your gig oh crowd didn't get my music it's like dude you got a memory stick with three thousand songs on <laughs> what do you mean they didn't get the music it's like you didn't get the crowd jesus christ if they need michael jackson you play michael jackson your job is there to entertain people to give them a good time not Try and if you don't want to change what you do for the people, stay at home. Yeah, it's not like you've got a box of records with 50 tracks in anymore, you know what I mean? Mm. 
Jesus. And then all these ones with masks and jumping up on the decks and <laughs> jumping around and cakes and that in the audience. And it's like, dude, you're just a DJ playing other people's music, yeah? Mm. Uh, I could not agree more with you, mate. I, I'm exactly the same. I, I just watch. It's like a charade. I'm like, what? what's with the mask? What's with the cake throwing? I know if I'm paying, again, you know, 30, 40 quid to go watch somebody play, I sure as hell are not going to get hit in the face with a cake because I'm going to get on that stage and I'm going to smack the living shit out of you. <laughs> yeah, I just don't get it. I mean, there's people in the audience going, hit me with a cake. I don't get it. it. It's, you know, and especially like in America, you know, they, they've labeled EDM. I, I do not yeah. like that label. Uh, it's it's all dance music, isn't it? You know, yeah. obviously it's electronic music, but it's dance music. The EDM just separates it. And it's to me, it's more yeah. pop based dance well, music. When we arrived there with, and we signed to Madonna's label, Maverick and all that, they were like, we're going to give Electronic a nine months. And uh, we're like, what? Uh, in the room, they're like, Electronica, that's what we're, that's what we're going to call it. We're going to brand it as Electronica. We're going to give it nine months. If it doesn't work, we'll drop it off the label. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, and they're going, what do you think of my snare drum? Fuck your snare drum, dude. Nobody's dancing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Who cares about your snare drum? Look at the people. They don't nobody's dancing. You track you're writing dance music and you're more worried about how the sounds are. You know, we were all raw punk, 16 track sequence up, you know what I mean, with a little screen with a dot going across, sampling and making new recipes, you know what I mean? Not all this I mean, ever trick with snare drum. It's like, listen, dude, your snare drum sounds how it sounded in your studio it might sound amazing. That's what you wanted, yeah. But there's not another system in the world the same as your bedroom. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Half of it's mono, half of it's got too much bass on it to get a life. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then people are playing it on an iPhone. You know, it's like, yeah, man, uh, your production. Do you put a click on your bass drum? A click on your bass drum. You know, this is about eight years ago. All this shit started. Yeah, if you don't have a on your bass drum, no, we can hear it on their iPhone. Really? You think I really care about writing music for people to listen to on an iPhone out the speaker? That I have to now take that into my brain and like not be thinking, oh, if I can get 30 hertz, I can get people to shit themselves. It's more like, yeah, go on, if I can put a little click on top of my bass drum so that people know there's a bass drum there. You know what I mean? It's like, what has it come to? <laughs> Uh, it's changed so much like you know it, it's it, there's good and bad in it you know i mean it opens a store for more and more people to like hear you know dance music but then it also opens the door for a lot more clowns like who yeah, but, see still, a dollar bill but i still don't think it's um you know if you said to if i have said to you you know, like in the nineties, for example, like, man, look, check out this white label I've got from Nicky Finn or whatever. You know, within you could guarantee if it was like your if it was a good track, within a month it, the whole country knew it on the rave scene. You know what I mean? Man, I'll write a track now and I'm connected to the world. You'd be lucky for three, four hundred people find it, hear it, you know what I mean? It's 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 just pathetic. You know, it's like oh, you know, I'm not. You know, I, I, I don't like socials. I, I need to put more effort into it if you really want to achieve it. But this is just the whole thing. It's like, you know, it's like, man, hang on. I've got to get ripped off on Spotify. I won't put my music on Spotify. It's on a record label. I can't do nothing about it. And that's all cool. You know, that's that's it. But personally, if I release music, I won't put it on there. I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to insult myself by what you pay. I'm not going to make all the header and the page really for you to take money from me and rip me off, you know, because you have to do all the design and the layout and all that stuff. You're only doing that for them. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you might get a few visitors and a few people come, but they, they pay £10 a month. They ain't buying the stuff. They just press play. They don't give a toss. You know, that's how it is for them. So, you know, and then you've got Spotify allegedly sponsoring weapons companies. Well, what, what do I want to give them money for? You know what I mean? Investing in weapons. 
no thank you iTunes all of them you know and then now it's like you know oh if you if you put it on Instagram or oh, you got a TikTok like, dude anything my daughter's into I ain't into yeah <laughs> you know what I mean it's like bad enough Facebook Instagram TikTok you know SoundCloud YouTube you know and it's like all I'm doing is putting all the effort in to make them people money because they don't pay me fairly for that you know it's like if you want to give me a job pay me man you know what I mean but I, I, I can't do it I'd rather I've got band camp now you know and, and even if I sell like 100 quid's worth of stuff I can take that money within two days and, and invest it in myself mm-hmm. so you know what I mean in a new plug in or like, you don't see nothing from music nothing you know, you just get screwed over. And and like this week, oh, yeah, a thousand of your followers on Facebook want, want to connect with you on Theta or whatever, the new thing that Facebook are doing to try and compete with Twitter. You know, and it's like, dude, really? I've got 25,000 followers the most on any one of my platforms. Yeah, I come from a band that's got 3 million followers. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like... You know, I'll post, I'll post a, a new clip from a track. Oh, 4,000 likes. But I've got 400 people following me on Bandcamp. You know, it's, it's like, oh, you know, I've got to get another app. Well, uh, well I don't. I'm not going to put my details in, log in, put my credit card in just to pay £1.50 for your track. You know, I'll have another app on my phone and something else that I have to go to. Oh, man, do you see my posts on Instagram? No, oh, I don't do Instagram. I do Facebook. Do you see my post on Facebook? No, 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 I got Facebook, I only do Twitter. It, it's just like flogging a dead horse. You know, it's like I'm trying to, you know, I, I'm trying to build my website and everything. You know, I've got people who subscribe to me on Bandcamp and all that. But again, all these companies take money. You know, so why can't you just subscribe to me on my website? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if uh, someone needs to come up with a software, where it's just like, right, this is, I I get up, open my website up, my Facebook page, my Instagram, my Twitter, they're all in the top of my web web page. And I can see which one has got any activity on it. And if I want to use it, look at it, I'm there. Get kind of different bloody pages and all that. It just does nothing. With the technology, it's so simple to, to make this stuff happen nowadays, you know. But they won't because they need all that, the algorithms, all the traffic and everything, you know. So, yeah, I'm a bit old school. I love technology. I'm playing with AI. I love everything. But I don't like the models of, of greed. I don't – that's the way the world is now. Greed, five minutes of fame. You know, some of the things these people do uh, online to get attention is, is, is wrong. And that's the society they want bread. I'm, I'm you know – sound like an old man now but the state of things at the moment you know when i went to the golf club last week and i tried to identify as a woman for 18 holes so i could get off the the closer tee but no one was having none of it (laughs) well let's let's get to your other love which is football and arsenal um so who 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 was your you know favorite favorite player growing up I'm not going to lie, I was, until I reached the age of 10 or 11, I couldn't tell you who I supported, really. My family, if I'm using it, my dad, my mum and dad split up, but my dad and my nan lived around the corner from Highbury. So my dad was always on at me about Arsenal. My stepdad supported Tottenham. They bought me a Tottenham Spurs lampshade. All my mates uh, were West Ham, so I had a West Ham shirt. Then Bobby Robson talked, uh, had Paul Mariner and John Walk and all that. The 77, I think, around that time, Ipswich, I had an Ipswich shirt because they were the closest, closest to us as West Ham were. So, yeah, I was pretty mixed up as a kid. And uh, until I went to I went to see Arsenal play Watford when I was about 11. When I was like, man, yeah, this, I'm, gonna, I'm choosing Arsenal. It's my family. It's my nan's around the corner. My dad's around the corner. This is where my family come from. So I'm going to run with Arsenal. And they're black players as well. You know, and I remember seeing John Barnes there that day. Barnes here at Watford. <coughs> Got his autograph and stuff, you know. And, uh, uh, yeah, 
it was just that's it. I'm gonna I'm gonna choose Arsenal now without any influence from anyone else. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Or who's winning, or who's you know Paul Mona. I remember going to see Ipswich and watching Johan Cruyff and Neeskins from Barcelona. You know, so <laughs> I can't regret uh, having six months of Ipswich or one season. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now Arsenal, I, it's righty. You got to say uh, there's different genres. Obviously, you had Stapleton and David O'Leary and them teams and Charlie George and stuff. You know, Alan Sunderland. Willie Young, that sort of period and everything. Um, but, it, yeah, right in, man. Right in. It's just like, ah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I see a good thing from Rio the other day. He's just talking about right in. He said, he didn't support Arsenal. You, you liked right in. You either hated him or you, you, he was just, everyone loved right in, you know, because he was just, you could relate to him, couldn't you? He was real, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, so, I, and I know him. It's funny because I know so many of them now, but, like, you know, I know him here and I, I think in the scheme of things, if if you actually looked at his finishing and everything, he it, it was up there, man. He was proper up there. Um, and then, of course, you've got the, the Wenger era, um, like Thierry, Thierry's ex-wife is his godmother to my daughter. So, like, uh, when she was pregnant with their kid, he used to babysit for me so he could get a bit of a bit of practice. <laughs> but, uh, man, he was, well, he's, he's, he's one of the best players ever. It's, you go around his house and there's just footballs everywhere. Every two metres, there's footballs on the floor. And he's like, I should go down the Xbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I go walking towards the room and he's just hit a ball, flick it up in the air, do about 28 spins and stop it dead and carry on walking. And I'm just like, and then the next one, you know, and stuff like that. And then I'll be like, <clears throat> I'll go and watch him and I'll get up in his box and everything. And after the game, we'd, we'd go back to his or whatever. And he'd be like, I'm like, man, you went over, you took that free kick on the right side of the pitch with your left foot, didn't you? Because you saw that. I was like, yeah. I couldn't believe you were lining up because, yeah, man, I'm standing, I'm standing behind in training, working on it. You know, and like, it, when I say arrogance, it, it's not a big head, but the, the self-belief he had in himself. You know, I went to his wedding, man, he wouldn't even have a glass of champagne. You know, he said, man, I can drink when I finish playing football if I want to. You know, he, he wouldn't put a anodine, a aspirin, a parrot. He wouldn't touch a thing. All he had was a homeopathic um, medicine, you know, and like the dedication. And I mean, and to be honest, like for the band, right, you, people think what they want, but we never done drugs or nothing. We were just like, that was the, we strive to commit to be the best we could be because that was the best drug you could ever get, that performing in front of people, you know. And um, so I could relate to him, you know, like, like man, you should get the balloons. Oh, maybe I'll get it next year. I'll try, you know, you know, and and the self belief he had was was inspiring, really. You know, I, I'd say to him, the worst thing was because we were sort of like there his teammates and everything, you know, and I'm like, yeah, man. Uh, uh, so what's what's Will Ward like then? You know, it's because like, really. Just seems to panic. I was like, when he gets through, he skies on me, <laughs> you know, keep missing, kept missing. And that. <laughs> it's like, dude, he said, you see him in training, he don't miss, he don't miss. He said, you wouldn't believe it. He says, because it plays him out on the wing. And uh, I said, there was one game, I said, uh, he lost the ball, put his hands on his knees. And he was like, that was Newcastle's second half last season. He knew the exact moment that he'd done it. He won't have it. He said, yeah, I won't have none of that afterwards, you know. And, uh, I was, you know, and I'm thinking, I don't want to offend you. Yeah, I said, well, you know, like, at least Pires, it took him sort of six months, but he can't tackle, but he gets goal side. He chases back all the time. We'll talk, he's like, yeah, you know, you still feel a bit like you're dissing his mates a bit, but. He's talking about football, so he's kind of honest about it, you know. Um, and Burkham, I mean, it's hard, it's very hard because you know, Burkham was a magician, Tony Adams, and 
you know, that back four, what Wenger done, he got another three or four years out of all of them. And they, it's hard to say they all got better and better. You know, they, Adams was a donkey, they called him, and then he's running out of running out with the ball at his feet against Evans, all like the pitch was volleying, half volleying to the net, you know, to win the title and stuff. And man, you know, what Wenger done for English football, I think everybody just went, man, hands up. That team is just the best you've seen in England, you know, to be fair. It was kind of, it was a Hanson, Sunas, Dalglish era of, of the Paisley playing football, keeping the ball on the floor. The defence, if you look at having a sweeper, Hanson and Lawrence and the way they, I was watching a couple of clips the other day of Hanson coming out with the ball, mm-hmm. playing a little ball over the top and running all the way through. And, you know, I, I think he might have missed, <laughs> missed at the end, but that Liverpool team, in terms of the way it played football, was years ahead of everywhere. Everyone else, everyone else, you know, and I think Wenger was the same. Um, I done a football, I done a football thing uh, at Docklands for the Arsenal. And I'm buzzing, so I've still got the, I've got the Premiership kit with my name on the back with the proper kit. You know, it's got pants in the shorts and everything. And uh, <clears throat> I've done this, and I remember it was there with Parler, Winterburn, Wrighty, and they're going, "Yeah, man, you know, I remember when when Wenger came." And uh, the day he turned up for training, we were all at Ali Pali, Alexander Palace, running up and down the, running up and down the hill, running up and down the hill, all trying to put an effort in, you know, to impress him, trying a lot harder than we normally would, and all that. He said he stood at the bottom of the hill, watched us run up and down the hill three times. We all come down, sweating and panting, st- standing there, you know, thinking, yeah, he must be impressing it. And he's like. Why are you running up and down hills? Football pitches are flat. We <laughs> all <laughs> just went, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <why? laughs> why are you running up and down hills? Football pitches are flat. <laughs> ah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it makes you makes you really think. Why? Why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, from the simplest of things and then changing their diet and that. And, you know, I'm sure all of them, that back four, would tell you that, man, if you've got hold of them five years earlier in their careers and stuff, because you've got to admit, Adams become a better and better player until he retired, didn't he? Yeah. Well, long- longevity as well, you know. I mean, all, all those players, like in the early, like, 80s and 90s were still heavily drinking and smoking, you know, partying. Like, as soon as the game's done, that's it. But then, uh, you know, Wenger just came along and he, he changed the whole landscape of, like, yeah. how how to, you know, be a professional footballer, take care of yourself mentally, physically, you know. And and, and he set the blueprint, you know. That's why, why, I, why I love Klopp so much as well. I think well, he... Yeah, I think after after Wenger, you, you, you're talking. I wouldn't. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't really put Mourinho up there because I think not not as for his not for his achievements, but for his style of football, I can't put him in the same sort of bracket as um, you know. It's about winning, and he he he, he done that fair and square. But it weren't until we got to that that Barcelona Guardiola thing again. Um, yeah, Cruyff had his, of course, he had his moments, with, but that's a long before I was, you know, recognising it of it really, um, age wise. But that Barcelona team was the best team, uh, league team ever, 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 ever. That TikTok, when that tic tac stuff kind of, <laughs> and that, you know, with me, I when I used to when I go to, I, when I play football, I can only play a hundred percent. Um, man, I played about. Two months ago, mate, I was blowing out my ass after five minutes. And uh, it was just like, I can only play 100%. But even when I was training, I didn't tackle people, but I was pressing them in their face so quick that they have to make a mistake or do something with it. Yeah. They were like, oh, you need to calm down a bit. I'm like, dude, I ain't ca- tackled you, have you? No. You just kicked the ball off when you saw me running at you. You know, <laughs> 
give it away. I mean, I, I ain't even touched. I really appreciated that. And they were small people and it it was just incredible. It was incredible, you know. And now, and then what Klopp done at Dortmund without the ball um, changed it again. And now I think uh, they had to suddenly bring that to the best league in the world, which was England, because, you know, the running, there's nothing. No team, Man United, Liverpool, we all proved it. We played till 95 minutes. You know, that Liverpool, Bayern Munich, uh, not Bayern Munich, <laughs> Milan. I was in Italy all the time, man. And my mate supports Milan. From I used to go with all the time. You know, he's messaging me at half time. Because it's like, what's going on? I said, of course, I support Liverpool. It's an English team, man. I, you know, I'm, I'm supporting Liverpool. You know, it's me at half-time. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, I said to him, dude, I said, you had like Maldini and all that. They're going, tonight I'm going to go to Luigi's. I'm going to have some champagne and some pasta and some parmigiano at half-time. They're all thinking like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so then suddenly Stephen Gerrard appeared. I said, um, I said he wouldn't. He didn't answer his phone. He wouldn't message answer a message from me for at least three days. He was stuck behind. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you you see that that Milan team on on paper, and you're like, this is one of the best teams in the world, if not ever at that point in time. No chance should have Liverpool come close to, to you know. I mean, I, I, when I watched that, you know, when, when Stevie scored the header, you know, I was like, all right, 3-1, we've saved face. You know, we, we've got a goal and I'm I'm good with that. When that second one went in, I'm like, we're winning this. It, it, it was just a turnaround. I mean, again, you know, a tactical decision by Benitez to bring on Haman and take off Stevie Finnan. That really mm-hmm. helped the midfield. Because um, we were just getting overrun, but no way should we have beaten that Milan team. Not a chance, man. I I have to say I think um, I can't talk. If you did uh, going back five years, let's say five years at least, I, I think Stephen Gerrard's the best English player that we've ever produced as an all-round player. Um, you know, uh, the Lampard Gerrard debate. I don't think it's, it's, it can even go on. Don't get me wrong. I know Frank, and don't get me wrong. He's Amazing player, amazing player. But Gerard, just everything, everything, every single thing, you know. Um, and Scalzi, when I talked to Vieira, he, you know, he's like, man, Paul Scalzi is the hardest player I've played against. He said, you go out and he's just gone. He said, you, if, you, if you just, he's gone. You'd stand next to him and he's gone. <laughs> you know, and but again, he's one of those people that unless you had a camera on him for the whole game, you wouldn't really appreciate how good he is. I think there's still a lot of people like that, you know, that it's what they do without the ball. Making space ain't, is when you look at a football pitch and you see a goal kick and that, and they're all in that group, that ain't, it's really, really hard to make space, really. You know, that it's like, you know, so, but for me, Gerard was, he was the most complete English player we had. I wouldn't say now. Now is a wow. It's just wow. It's uh, Spain had their time off that Barcelona time, Euros, World Cup. France have had it. it it's England's time now. And, you know, if we don't, we, 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 we won't. You can't, you know, it's not automatic, but. There's never been an England team where you could put three players in every single position and struggle to choose which one to start. I mean, Saka, yeah, I'm Arsenal, but oh, brilliant. there ain't a person, there ain't a person who ain't going to put their hand up and go, my God, that kid. You know, if you can get him, uh, even Foden, Foden, you know, Bellingham, Grealish, you know, the defenders, Trent. I mean, thank God they've put Trent up forward a bit. He ain't, he's, he'd wreck his career if they don't move him away from that right back position because he ain't a natural defender, you know. And 
it's like having Beckham playing him at left back when he's the best crosser in the ball in the world. You know, if you 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 put Alexander Arnold in the midfield that 30, 40 yards forward, it's deadly. It's deadly from a right back. Mm-hmm. And it's not, you know, from a right back, he either had to cross it or, you know, a bit of a long ball. But from in that midfield, he'd be able to slot things through. It's like, be like De Bruyne, do you know what I mean? Or Burkamp, that just precision. So, yeah, Rhys James, you know, pretty hard. And then you've got Kyle Walker. That's just Trippier. That's just right back, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Rashford. Yeah, it's generational now, isn't it? It's just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I love Saka. I, I just think he, he's. I actually think it did him a world of good to miss that penalty for England in the Euros. I really do. I mean, I felt for him, you know, at the time, but you know, I, I, I think he's matured more. He's taken a lot more responsibility on. I mean, watching that Arsenal team last season was actually, for me, like watching Liverpool two, three seasons ago. You were mm-hmm. so on it. I mean, yeah. everybody knew their jobs and they were doing it. And, I mean, it must have been a joy for you as an Arsenal fan to to watch that. But, you know... Man, exactly like you say. I mean, when you got Van Dijk and that, I mean, you see someone... It was like getting in the ring with Tyson. They get the ball and they notice Van Dijk. And uh, no, I can't get past him. He's going to do me. He had the mentality already that he, like Tyson, you've lost before you even, you know, and like you say, that system and the work rate, I think, again, unless you had a camera on Mano, you wouldn't quite realise how amazing he was, you know, and Firmino, to be fair, because, you know, it's easy for the other three or the others who bang more in, uh, towards the later side side of it. But for me, no, it's positional play. And, you know, it was a bit of a Berbatov sharing them that intelligent to set other people into the game, you know. Um, that team, yeah, it was, it, was, it was awesome. It was awesome to watch Robertson and Trent, you know, going forward as well. Um, so you must have thought when that, that season, man, my team are back. And that's all I can say. It's like, you know, my team's back. That's how I look at it. I think, um, of course, you're going to make the Man City comparisons because Arteta was there. Uh, but it, this football now is a whole, whole, whole different thing. And, you know, bless him, this thing going on with Pepe at the moment, uh, Arsenal, you know, Um you know, you can't disrespect him, but he grew up in the Ivory Coast. You know, and like when you watch that tap, that program with Arsenal on Netflix and that, and it, it, Arteta walks into the room and there's a tactical blackboard. He's going, "So you three move to you know transition to here," and you see Claude Pepe just go, "Oh man!" You can see it. Oh man, that ain't going to go in. You know what I mean? It, it, it's football's chess now. It's not. It's not a man working man's. It's like. Dude, right? <clears throat> when we got the ball with with this four four three or whatever, when they got the ball with five four two, if they got the ball in their own half with two four, mate, you know every person's got to be totally aware of where everyone else is and what system they're in in an, an intelligent way that is has never been before, you know. And it, it's kind of if you ain't the right player for the mentality, then you're not work if you're not the right player who's prepared to be in a team because they make them do too many games and to be the best you need a squad and you can't have anybody who's why am I playing why am I playing week in week in and that that's kind of the main the first 11 is 22 and people if they can accept that you've got a winning formula and that's the difference now the kids the kids who are eight to ten are already being brought into the system that that's how it works. So they're not going to oppose it, you know. And for me to see an identity, you know, I never, last year, I never thought we were going to be where we were. It was about, you could see in brief moments, the, for the two seasons before, that there was a style, there was a shape. Where Emery was there, there was no shape, you know. And, and 
God forbid, you know, I'm not dissing, don't like dissing people, but I look at West Ham and this, what's your style? Mm-hmm. You know, I look Brighton at it's Brighton. Mm-hmm. I don't, it's not about nothing to do with money or anything anymore. Leicester, you know, it's about work ethic, team unity, and you can see all, that's why England do so well. They Everyone likes each other. You know, you know that Saka and Rice got on, you know that Grealish and uh, someone from Liverpool got on, or, you know, there's none of that. They used to be on different tables, didn't they? Mm-hmm. You know, they've all grown up through the youth system, they all like each other, and, you know, you've got to have that in a team. If you look at Chelsea last year, 33 players, all backstabbing, no one wants to, you know, that, that, that ain't going to work. And I think the fact that the age of the team is just like, wow, if they all buy into it, what a future. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it is Barcelona, it's, it's everything else, because even City ain't got that. You know, there's, uh, there's not another team that's got like four or five Hal End boys that have grown up together. He know, you know, Smith Rowe and Reese Nelson and Inketia and Saka, they must know 10% of what each other's going to do. You know, you know what I'm saying? Compared to Trossard or, you know, so Odegaard, the boy's a magician. It's hard to think of anyone who can deal in a tight in a tight space like he does. You know what I mean? He don't just don't panic, does he? Yeah, Get it is. No, it's just a joy joy to watch. You know, I mean, I am a Liverpool fan, but I'm also a football fan as well. You know, yeah, that comes you know, first, man. Just what watching Arsenal last season, just and and obviously, I didn't want City to win the league again. You know, I don't want to get it to be like a farmer's league where it's just city, city. I mean, we we took them toe to toe, you know, the last four or five seasons before that, you know, came so close, lost out by a point twice, you know, beat them and then lost More again. Margins, man. Yeah, it is. And I, and I felt for Arsenal fans, you know, like the last 10 matches, just it just seemed it was too much for the team, you know. Yeah, I didn't, you know what, I weren't gutted at all because I was like, man, you know, we're competing. If you said this to me at the start of the season, I'd have been mad. But there's there's future, there's a brief, you know, now there's like, man, if you look at Ed who said uh, at the end of last season, you know, the phone was ringing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've got uh, Sansa who wants to play for you. And that's the difference now, man. You know, Declan Rice, dude. He chose he he chose that project. Not you know, and I'm only read the things. He, it's like man, I've been here three weeks. So I thought I knew about football, but the detail Arteta goes into, and you know, and that's what you want to hear. You want people to be buying into something. You know, ringing, knocking on your door. I want to play for you, not them. Mm. You know, and that's what people are doing now, and that's that's because what they saw last season you know the mentality the the style of play yeah just the ethics are right you know and to have some like Arteta you can you can tell he's like that Guardiola madness for it uh but yeah it's exciting man because he's played for us and you know what I mean when they were who's going to who should they assign? And they got Emery, but they were talking about Arteta then. And I was thinking, no, oh, no, nah, let him stay with Guardiola <laughs> for a while, you know. But well, I mean, we, we we do live in a in a world, especially football as well, though that you know managers aren't given that much time. It, it's like you've got to win or you're out the door. You know, I mean, all you have to do is look down the street, Chelsea. You know, even they've won trophies and they're still out the door. That's not how it should be. You know, I'm I'm still amazed at Klopp. I I think right now he's in his eighth season, so he's the the most uh, longest serving coach in, in the Premier League, which is madness to to really think about that. You know, I mean, you have to look back to like Fergie days uh, and and Wenger days to where you know they've been given. You know this opportunity, and I noticed like the, the first couple of seasons with Arteta. You know, I've got Arsenal mates that would go in, 
get rid of him. He's, he, no, he's, no. he's not going to get us back to where we're supposed to be. And he proved the point last season. I could see it. I, could see it. I, was, you know, I could see moments where I was like, yeah, man. I mean, we won the FA Cup, the charity shield. There was moments, but it was also that thing of uh, knowing they're not his players. You know, right? and like I say, Pepe, he wouldn't make my team. He's a very skillful player and everything. But like I said to you, even when I train, I have to have 100%. And if he was playing with me, I'd be losing it with him for not trying hard enough. You know, I can't I can't stand that. And, you know, uh, Boumian got like that. Abu, when he got all that, all the politics started and the coming late and all that. You know, he was an amazing player. But the way I t- handled that, you know, I think it was amazing. I, I think them Yanks have, have gone up. Man, we need to buy into this fella because, he, you know, he, he's not interested in uh, compromise. Mm-hmm. I, I reckon he sat down and said, look, if you want me to manage, this is how it's going to be. This is my plan. You know he's got, you know he's got a, a direction, a plan. Do you know what I mean? He, he, he's got a vision for where <clears throat> that club should be and how the football should be. And man, look at Trossard, master, master stroke, Odegaard, you know, uh, Zinchenko, mm-hmm. Jesus. And, you know, I, I'm still sitting here saying, man, Jesus ain't going to win us a league. He ain't going to win us a league. But he's the best pressing forward in the world. And you've got Martinelli and Saka and Odegaard banging them in. So, you know, how can you feel about it? It's a different, it's modern football. He's a modern footballer. Mm-hmm. I don't feel, never at City, I've never thought he's been a natural goal scorer. It's not an Ian Wright or, he'll get his 10 to 15 goals, I think, every year. But he's not going to get your Harry Kane numbers, you know, or Salah numbers, you know what I mean? Saka... I'm going to spread it out. That's fair enough. It's fair enough. But it's so hard to to want to lose him, Jesus, because his hold-up player is, is brilliant. It's so good. But, but, is he going to win you to get the goals and win the league? I don't think so. He didn't do it in Man City, did he? He didn't bang him in all there. And he was with that team, De Bruyne and everything as well. So, yeah, I, I just think I like Arteta's mentality. I think you make it a squad game, and Ketia is a poacher. He, he'll get you a few goals, and you know he can sculpt him to be what he wants to be. You know, in order he can with these young kids, he's got the talents there. Now he can say, right, if you've got the intelligence to make these moves and do this, what you've got already, I'm just going to add to. You know, with with like I say with Pepe, I don't think he can really understand I don't think he's intelligent enough to understand what's needed and he's got I don't think he's got the right attitude and that's an environment in the background that he brought up in you know not everyone is is going to have the same energy and drive are they you know um, but will they win the league this year the only thing I can say on that is it depends on the city really um, I think we're the same as last year. We're definitely capable of it. Uh, but they got Haaland. I mean, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, the guy don't touch your ball. He don't touch your ball the whole game. You put it in the box and it's in. You only need, that's what strikers the best do, isn't it? You know, so without De Bruyne for a good few months, it's a tricky one. I think if they get that pack of tar from West Ham, they'll be doing well. Yeah, that's the thing, you know. They, they they just recruit really well. Alvarez, I I rate as well. You know, if Hallen goes out, you know, for a number of games, you've got Alvarez to come in. That's that's the thing with City, you know, that a lot of other teams don't have. I mean, you know, our team, we 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 just we seem to be missing at least one or two more players for no, the you're, gym. You're midfield. You're midfield. I mean, let's face it. Look, I, can, I think. Uh, if Darwin <clears throat> gets some stabilizers, he'll 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 be amazing <clears throat> eventually. 
it just needs a bit of time to bed in. He's too rushed all the time with his pace. You know, you see it a lot with fast players, man. They, they fumble the last bits because it's, this is not quite... You can't appreciate how fast they're moving sometimes. Do you know what I mean? And it's got to be perfection at that uh, that kind of... That running onto a goalkeeper is quite easy to put it past the post if it ain't perfect, you know. And I think his time will come. I think your best player at the moment, obviously Salah, but is Jota. That dude is the most underrated, one of the most underrated in the Premiership. He's so clever. He arrives. He works hard. I think Luis uh, Diaz, another one, he's got the work rate that, you know, Klopp demands, really. I think the front, I don't think you've got anything that wrong up front. I think your midfield, yeah, McAllister's a brilliant buyer. I still think you need that. I don't know, a couple more in there, I'd say, for sure. I think Thiago's too old. I think well, Henderson- I mean, yeah, Thiago's been, you know, I mean... T- when he's fit, that that's the thing. When he's fit, he, he's incredible. He's one of the best passers of the ball. But it, if he can't stay fit for 20 games a season, then, uh, you know, we just need to move him on. I mean, to, to me, like, our, our problem at the moment is defensive mid. We brought Endo in, you know, the Japanese lad. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we'll, we'll see if that works out. The problem is, is we're playing McAllister as a six. And he's not a six, you know, he's more creative. And the uh, slobber sly, absolutely cracking footballer, you mm-hmm. know. But again, bringing Trent into midfield, we we need a proper right back, you know, if, if that's what, what, because right now what's, what's happening is the double pivot with Trent also yeah. kind of playing the six is not working. It leaves us way too exposed on that right side. It, it it showed last season and it's showing the first couple of matches. You know, thank God, yeah. you know, a draw away to Chelsea is, I, I think, is fair for the first match of the season. We beat Bournemouth. We started out really poorly, but, you know, came into the game. Um, I, I think, you know, we just still need that proper DM, you know. I mean, I, I, love, I love the young lad, uh, Bersetic. But again, he's a young lad. Average, yeah. It's Average. just, yeah. Well, I mean, that's another one. You know, people band about, but I, I just, you know, he's twenty-seven now. His injury record is not good. Uh, I like the the lad from Palace, Ducor, Ducore. Yeah, yeah, he was at Watford. That's what he. he uh, maybe. But again, you know, just just the prices uh, are just insane. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's Chelsea's fault. Got, got a yeah, fifty-eight year, not, 58 year contract. A, yeah, <laughs> I mean, again, well, I mean, I I think every football team would probably have kind of done that if they'd known the loophole that Chelsea were doing. But you know, that's getting shut down the the uh, the end of this season. You know, and then you're going to have a bunch of players on con- nine-year contracts. So they, none of them, you know, I mean, Lavia is not. He wasn't even on the bench. No, you no. know, he, and and he's going well. You know, I I I went to Chelsea for history and all this bollocks. I'm like, nah, you went for money. You went for money, mate. Like, like just, I wish some of these people, players, would be honest and go, I went there for money. And that's it. I, I've yes. got to take care of my family. All right. Well, go, good for you. But, oh, yeah, that, I mean, it's just oh, I can't stand them. They just destroyed so many English people, man. I'm sorry, but that's that's my biggest thing I hate about Chelsea. You know, uh, loss is cheek. All right, it's gone now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Gallagher, you know, the, uh, Billy... Who's the one that has gone to Brighton now? The Scottish lad. Little guy. Man, they're, they're just... They used to farm it. When they got Joe Cole back in the day, they were, yeah, we saw you from West Ham, now we're going to send you on loan to Russia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't go to Russia. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But, like, yeah... Who's, uh, Hudson Obi or whatever is that? Where the hell's he gone? Yeah, exactly. They've all dropped off, off the face of the earth and, like, it's... Man. 
Mount, they've got so uh, many. It's just these loopholes, and then all these players out on loan, and then just you know now now you know Bowley's kind of in bed with the the Saudis. So there yeah. was yeah, like I can get rid of some of these players for a lot of money and to the Saudi league. I mean, it's all intertwined. There's all a lot of back backhanders going on. I can't I can't stand it. But you know, um, I wanted to ask you like, what's what's your one of your favourite like Liverpool Arsenal classic matches? Uh, please about... don't tell. Please don't tell me that you, when you won the league at Anfield. What the Mark Michael <laughs> Thomas one? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was a good one, but um, no, I, I, I <laughs> got, got to put your hands up and say that our Shavin's entrance was pretty good when he banged forward. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was pretty impressive. And then I just think, oh man, you, you, anything with Burke, uh, anything with Burke having on, really, you know, uh, even watching him roast Carragher, it's the same thing as the Van Dyke thing. You must have seen, uh, Old Marie step onto the pitch as a player. Oh, man. Uh, hope he's done come over my side of the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> like Salah, you know, you you cannot you cannot control greatness. Zola, Klinsman, Berbatov, to be fair, Harry Kane, you know, you can't control greatness and Drogba. You know, I've been privileged to sort of just watch these people and just think, yeah, man, I'd do that. I'm really just like, when you see him skip past people, like, the speed he had was just, it was, you can't fathom it, really, you know. <laughs> but yeah, the last year in four was pretty impressive, really. Yeah, I mean, I've got so much. Just, just <clears throat> what. And it's just crazy to think about that that lad as well because I mean he was so talented and then just dropped off the face of the earth. But mm. I loved it how when he scored number four, he just shook his head and was just going like, "I've just scored four at Anfield." Yeah, <laughs> I mean we've always had classic matches us and Arsenal. It's it's uh -huh. it's one I look for, you know, when when the. The fixture list comes out just because I'm like, you know, you know, there's going to be goals, you know, there's yeah. going to be some like, you know, some. I mean, especially Arteta and Klopp, they're so like into their football that they let their emotions take over because, you know, when when you came to ours, it, it was pretty much a dull match, and then Arteta got all pissed off, and then that riled up the the Anfield crowd, and then that yeah, riled yeah, up yeah, Klopp. Yeah. And then Liverpool turned it around. So yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's yeah. again the little things. But yeah, I I love Arteta's passion. I love Klopp's passion. You know, the, the I think Arteta is in this business for a long time to come. And you know, I I always say if Liverpool can't win the league, then you know let Arsenal do it because they they play really good attract attractive football, and that's that's what I like. But um, I want to get your predictions for for top four. And then, uh, last but not least, um, a f your f dream festival lineup for Friday, Saturday, Sunday headliners, uh, alive or or dead. So I'd say, um, uh, well, I've got to go for it. I've got to say Arsenal, City. Tricky one, Arsenal City. It's, you should ask me this in two more weeks. <laughs> Depends on who they <laughs> sign. Because I think I, I think I think Chelsea will get it together too late to mm -hmm. to do anything. But I think Newcastle are only building on what they already done, which was pretty amazing considering the players they got, you know, he's, he's just got a wicked ethic and belief and camaraderie again. You know, if they hold that, then I think Newcastle will probably be third. And I think if Liverpool get the midfield, I think they'll, they'll be in the top four. But if they don't, I, I think it could be a bit of a... 
tricky one. Um, the thing is, I mean, look, I think Man U last season I would have said Man U towards the end, but that's gone. All of a sudden, that's gone again. Um, so yeah, I'd say Arsenal, City, Newcastle, Liverpool. That's my prediction. I think. Um, yeah, Liverpool it depends on if they get a few more players in. Because it's a bit scary this year, that, that McAllister red card and these cards and kicking all is a bit uh, light, isn't it? That's a it's, joke. it's too light for me, man. It's like it's going to ruin so many games if they're not careful. You know, because it, 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 common sense states frustration is to knock that ball away, to get back in position, it's not always to to be out of order. It's just a reaction to give yourself, you know, a couple of metres to give yourself, get back inside or back in position. And you're going to get people going, yell a car for that. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on. And then he's going to do a, a little professional foul, which you borderline, and then they're going to be off, you know. And the, and the, you know, and the oh, I do think, our tech was pretty the cause of it being out of order in the technical area. Like, just forget, he just ignores it really. And I don't, I think because of him, that's that rule being brought in. Um, yeah, that's the thing I'm a little bit worried about this season, to be honest. I think we're gonna, it's gonna take halfway through the season before they start changing it again. Cause I think the Callison thing was embarrassing. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it wasn't even like he had a straight leg or he followed through. He, he kind of, he went for the challenge, but his whole body weight was on his, coming away from the player. He was just like that, you know what I mean? And who, who played, um, who did I watch yesterday? Well, they did the same. Uh, Newcastle. Um, what's his name? <sighs> got mod his name, but he, he did the same same thing. He got nothing. Then there was the Fernandez one on the United match. Yeah, yeah, exactly the same. Just yeah. the yellow. Yeah, it's it, it's it's just getting ridiculous because it should be one rule and one rule only. And, yeah. uh, and you know we're supposed to be the best run league in the world, and our referees are absolutely atrocious. They can't yeah, get, get right, together. Man. VAR is just what's the point of having it? Just what's the point? That. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Does, the thing that does me with that one is when they're like, you know, it's a blatant offside, and then the ball goes through, and the keeper and the striker on a 50 50 or something. It's like someone's going to get a, a leg broken or something before they say, all oh, right, well, we should have stopped it because we knew he was offside. That, that, that is well, it's just pathetic. Yeah. You know, and then you have to wait to see if it was a goal or a nightmare, man. Ah, uh, take takes the passion out, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 people it's, don't know. People don't know whether to, you know, jump up uh, or you've got to look up at the, you know, the jumbotron to see, wait for the decision, and then you know, what shouldn't take so long takes too long, and then you're just like after they like, say a goal, you're like, yay! It it's uh, it's taken the enjoyment out, and and that's one thing that's. Uh, football's just getting ruined with that, you know. I, I just think it, it will go back to just a referee's decision. You know, they're human; they make mistakes. That's, yeah. that's the, only the, the only one I think is right is goal line technology. You know, I think that's <laughs> that's necessary because again, you, the, the, even the line has got to look past the post. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's, there's an abstraction, so obstruction. So, oh, yeah, that one I think is right, but. It's a physical game, man, and and adrenaline and pumped and that, and we know what's out of order. You know when someone just like impulse just rolls a ball away or something. You know what I mean? You can't be giving out yellow cards for that. Yeah, it's tough. It's, um, that could ruin it for me this year. So that's, I mean, even West Ham um, yesterday. It's watching them against Chelsea. And it's like, right, he's only got to sneeze and he's off. You know, and they were doing, they were for some really stupid stuff, you know. So that's, yeah, you know, let's hope that doesn't ruin it for the first few months. Headline lineup Festival Friday. Uh, we'll have, 
It's a tricky one. Some lads say Bob Marley. <laughs> and I think the bands are like that. I didn't say. <laughs> Let's say people back on the Friday. Probably Queen Saturday. Seen all the others. I've seen Foo Fighters. And, you know, with Bowie or Play with and stuff. The Beatles you've got to put in there, but they can, I get annoyed with people screaming behind me. <laughs> the girls. I went to see Prince. In concert with mates, and there's these two girls in Wembley Arena stood behind me and just screamed and shook tank tambourines for the whole well, for about 10 minutes until I told them, Fucking shut up, or I'll throw them off the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really, I told them to shut up, I didn't threaten to throw them off the balcony. So I didn't pay to listen to you scream and shake a tambourine in the air for, for like 30 quid for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fleet with Matt, Queen Bob Marley, I'll go with. Nice. Well, Liam is uh, Liam. God bless. I'm. I'm. I could have called you Keith, Maxim. No, Leroy. <laughs> yeah, it's so in. Like I, I'm. I'm still like. I feel like I'm a teenager though. Just, just because you know, in, interviewing uh, yourself, who, who's been part of my generation, you know, growing up, is just like it, it. It just amazes me how many people I I've met. You know, through doing this, and you know, gain gain friendships, and uh, because we all have the same thing. We love the football, we love the music. But um, any anything coming out for you? I know you have a, a upcoming release soon, right? Yeah, yeah I've done. A, I, don't know, I, had, I would have had eight tracks out this year so far. I've had. Um, I've been doing a lot of stuff with some Spanish breakbeat producers. For me, they they write the best breakbeat music at the moment. The Spanish, it's a bit of a weird scene when you go there. Um, if you don't play kind of exactly what they're into, it, it's you have to think about it, uh, you feel a bit awkward. But for the stuff they're producing, <clears throat> it's the best stuff. It's the only stuff I really buy anymore, really. Um, so I've done a couple of tracks with a guy called Rasco and uh, a guy called Hancock. Uh, I've got two, so I've got two of mine coming out first of September, possibly free. And I've got another one with Rasco September and then one in Hancock in October. So yeah, it'll be eight releases for me this year. So but again, the set like I was saying earlier, I won't put my Spotify and this and that. So I am cutting my own throat to an extent of awareness, but you know, you, you've got to have some morals in life, I think. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, for the listeners, you can go to uh, Leroy's band camp or you can get it straight from uh, Leroy Thornhill. Uh, is it .co.uk? .com. So you... Leroy Thornhill. Oh, just .com? Yeah. Yeah, so you can buy straight from there. So, uh, But Leroy, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Um, I mean, you know, it's already an hour forty something. Uh, I, I, you know, time goes by so quickly when you're just having a good conversation. Yeah. You know, and I, I love it. But uh, you know, I wish you all the best uh, for your future. You've already given us a, a brilliant past. So uh, you know, uh, just uh, you know, health and all that uh, good stuff to you. Um, everybody, thanks for listening. Please like, some, like, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Oh, man, what are you?